Hey guys, so it's me, Prax Ben, and I have my friend Jung Yin here with me. So we're starting this new podcast called The Great Fiction. It's uh, titled that after Hoppe's book, The Great Fiction, uh, which is about property, economy, society, and the politics of decline. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to bring on intellectuals and academics, or as Hoppe might call some of these people, the anti-intellectuals intellectuals, and they're going to teach us about economics, sociology, uh, the old right and stuff like that. And we want to really introduce you guys to these very important people. Our main objective is to promote the right libertarian position instead of some of the more libertine libertarianism that has been circulating the, the libertarian movement over the last couple of years. And you might argue the last couple of decades since the Cato Institute rose to gained gained a predominant position in this movement uh, but yeah we will be we will be discussing political philosophy history various topics and, and our guests will not only be libertarians we'll have many paleo conservatives on many many reactionaries so it'll be a it, it'll be a podcast that covers the entire scope the entire landscape so to speak of the old right and we hope to we hope to better inform and and better inform people about our not only our movement but just the the general movement uh, against the against the intellectual elite the what i might call the intellectual establishment the entire statist edifice can be brought down if only the work of the intellectuals is countered by the work of anti-intellectual intellectuals as i like to call them Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Great Fiction Podcast. This is our first episode where we will discuss the intellectual contributions of Hans Hermann Hoppe. And today we have Mr. Stefan Kinsella, who will be introduced by Zheng Yin. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to have with us today Stefan Kinsella, a close academic colleague of Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe's and a foremost contributor to the development of modern right libertarian thought. Mr. Kinsella is the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom and a former adjunct scholar of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, who holds an MS in Electrical Engineering from Louisiana State University and an LLM, or Master of Laws, from the University of London. He is a well-known opponent of intellectual property laws and has authored many prominent works on libertarian legal theory, such as Against Intellectual Property, Defending Argumentation Ethics, and Estopel, A New Justification for Individual Rights. Mr. Kinsella, thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here, guys, and uh, congrats on your on your new show. All right, so first, uh, we would like to discuss argumentation ethics, which is definitely one of the most well-known contributions of Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe. So we would like Mr. Kinsella to briefly elaborate on what argumentation ethics are and the significance they have for libertarian political philosophy. Yeah, well, so uh, Dr. Hoppe is actually perhaps nowadays more well known in certain circles for his uh, for the work that came after his earlier more theoretical Austrian and political theory work, um, uh, his democracy, his cultural theories, um, um, his immigration views. I think a lot of people know him. A lot of the younger generation of libertarians know him from that. Um, the earlier sort of generations, um, uh, my age and maybe a little bit older, um, knew him from the his his first two or three books, um, especially his first two books, um, his first two large books, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Um, that's his first books in English anyway. He had some in German, which is still yet to be translated. So, um, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism in eighteen, I want to say eighty nine, and then um, a, a collection of uh, essays, uh, economics, the economics and ethics of private property in 93. Um, and then there was uh, economic science and the Austrian method, which is a monograph on epistemology and methodology. Uh, and then later on, he started writing democracy and things like that. And um, he started the Property and Freedom Society near his retirement, um, which relates to your title of your show and his, his, his thought. Um, I, he first came to my attention when I was um, in law school in 1988. Um, he had moved from Germany to the U.S. in 1985 to study under Rothbard. He studied with Rothbard as his colleague for 10 years until Rothbard's death in 95. So from 85 to 95, he was with Rothbard over here, first in New York and then in Las Vegas. 
1988, he published a series of articles starting in Liberty Magazine and some newsletters published by the Mises Institute on argumentation ethics, which was his um, unique approach to justifying libertarian uh, principles. And instead of doing it in the consequentialist and utilitarian way, which a lot of people do, like uh, you know the sort of unprincipled um, uh, whatever works best, you know, um, liberty is best for uh, best for men because it pr produces lots of lots of guns and butter, um, which it does. But um, and and as opposed to the the other traditional approach, which is the more uh, deontological or natural rights approach, right? Which is the more Aristotelian or natural rights approach of Ayn Rand and even Murray Rothbard, his mentor and colleague, um, <clears throat> because he came from a more uh, Kantian background and also a Misesian background, but also absorbed the radical libertarian politics of Rothbard. He sort of synthesized what he knew and came up with his own approach to it. Uh, because he saw defects in consequentialism and utilitarianism, obviously, um, as an Austrian and as a principled libertarian. Uh, utilitarianism is unprincipled because it basically would would countenance violation of property rights for the greater good. You know, like you could steal half of Bill Gates's wealth and distribute it to the poor so if you believe that the poor are made better off by that, and Bill Gates is still rich. So, but. From our point of view, it's still theft, so we would oppose that. And methodologically, as an Austrian, you know, when you believe that value is subjective, that is, it's 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 what an individual, um, how the individual acts in the world and views things, and it's it, it's it's not a, a quantity that you can measure. So it's not it's not cardinal. It's an ordinal thing. Like it's just how you rank things. And it's, so therefore, it's not interpersonally comparable. You can't compare it between people. So you simply can't even theoretically add up these utils or these values to maximize utility. So there's various eth ethical and methodological problems as a libertarian and as an Austrian uh, with utilitarianism. The problem that Hoppe saw with the natural rights approach, um, which basically is the idea that uh, we, can, we can determine what we ought to do. Like that's normative thinking, right? Prescriptive thinking by asking what the nature of reality is. So you're basically going from an is to an ought. Now, he he agrees with David Hume that this is a logical gap that is unbridgeable. You cannot, you can't just announce what we should do based upon what the way things are, which is which is one criticism of natural law thinking. Uh, another criticism of natural law thinking is that it says that based upon what human nature is. It determines what we ought to do and how we ought to act, and these oughts inform what laws there should be too, so it informs politics and, and libertarian theory. Um, the, and one criticism of that is that human nature is so vague and so broad and diffuse that you can't get many prescriptions from that because people are different. Um, so what might be good for you is not good for me and so on. So there are many problems with the natural law approach. Primarily, you can't just announce I'm going from an from an from an is to an ought. Um, I think Hoppe implicitly recognized that you could only build oughts or normative statements upon earlier normative statements. So, because he was familiar with Kant and Kant's sort of categorical imperative and his idea of synth the synthetic a priori, the idea that you can get knowledge, uh, apodict uh, very certain knowledge, a week, which which Mises calls apodictic apodictic knowledge, um, from certain uh, logical uh, reflections like you can realize that certain things are un are uh, true by true because you would have to contradict yourself to deny them and actually this mode of thinking is common uh even ayn rand who thought she was opponent of kant had similar reasoning like like ayn rand thought that it was it was an she called them axioms which is a confusing terminology because axiom like in mathematics means a posited truth um where she meant it to be uh, something that's undeniably true which is Basically, what Kant thought um, his apodictic truths are, Mises thought his apodictic truths are. Mises restricted his analysis in this way mostly to praxeology and economics, like the the axiom or the or the undeniable truth that people, um, um, the a priori truth that humans act. And when you act, that has certain implications by definition and by our by our introspective understanding of what action is. So we know that when we act, we conceive of the universe. We're aware of certain facts. We have some dim awareness or understanding or hypothesis about the, the nature of causal laws that are in effect, 
and we have some dim awareness or some belief of the future that's coming and and something about the future that we think is coming without our intervention bothers us or gives us um, um, what's the word he uses uh, uh, uneasiness felt uneasiness and so we use our understanding of the way causal laws work and the tools at our disposal of scarce means he would call them to grapple them with our bodies and act and interfere and intervene in the course of events and to create a new universe in effect to change the course of events so that's what human action is and there are certain um, um, a priori categories of action like opportunity cost profit and loss uh, even uncertainty about the future various things like that so Hoppe, as a student of Mises, but also in philosophy, he studied under um, a very well-known German philosopher who I think is still alive, but he's very old now. He's a leftist, but he's extremely influential. His name is Jürgen Habermas. So Habermas was Hoppe's PhD advisor in Germany, um, and one of Habermas's contributions was what's called discourse ethics, or it's a type of argumentation ethics. He and another philosopher in Germany named Karl Otto Appel, so it's Appel and Habermas, sort of developed this discourse ethics view of, of political norms. Now, because they're kind of democrat socialist types, they work their theory into a defense of the democratic welfare state. Um, but the, the core idea there is that when people come together in discourse to solve you know, to discuss the right norms that we can use, what's just what action is justified uh, in interpersonal behavior, that there are certain normative presuppositions in the context of the argument itself. And those have to be, those can be identified. And once you identify those, those normative presuppositions of argument itself, those could never be challenged as unjust because you're assuming them to be just by virtue of participating in argumentation or discourse itself. Um, so actually, I've talked to Hans Hoppe about this a lot myself, and he actually was unaware of this, uh, or he didn't study this under Habermas. He studied uh, different things under Habermas, but he was aware of that, that writing and studied it after his PhD. Um, so he's actually never had a conversation with Habermas about this. But what Hans saw was that if you, if you blend or combine the insights of Austrian Misesian economics, which is praxeology and this sort of neo-Kantian understanding of the implications of human action, how humans use scarce means to act, right, which is a descriptive economic idea um, with some a priori categories. To combine that with the radical libertarian politics of Rothbard, um, being aware of the, of the drawbacks of the natural law approach, right, the, the inability to go from an is to an ought, he used sort of the core insight of Habermas and Appel to say, um, to basically bend their discourse ethics in the libertarian way. Like he thinks that they're, like they're wrong in how they apply their own discourse ethics to achieve democrat socialist results, but their core insight is valid. And the core insight is that there is a normative presupposition of all, of all discourse. Now, from Hans Hoppe's point of view, that is basically peace, right? Because uh, argumentation is a peaceful activity where people are, are having a discussion with each other and the attempt is to find the truth of a matter, either a factual empirical truth or a, um, or a, or a normative so truth, you can say, like which basically means a norm that you can justify argumentatively. That in Kantian terms, it means a norm that everyone can accept as fair given their, given their general characteristics and nature as participants' argumentation. So basically – and Hans emphasizes this over and over again in his argumentation ethics – um, the uh, one key thing to recognize is that when people argue, trying to find out, trying to just, trying to settle on a rule that they can both accept or a norm, they both agree to disagree if they have to, which means they're not coercing each other into accepting their argument. They're not basically threatening each other like, I propose this rule, and if you don't agree with me, I'm going to hit you over the head because that's not a genuine argument. A genuine argument is one where people are – or agreeing to disagree if they have to, which means to walk away, which is basically a normative stance of peace. So basically this normative presupposition of discourse is unavoidable when you're trying to argue with each other in a peaceful context about norms. So that's why you can build libertarian norms up without violating Hume's is-ought 
problem because you're going from an ought to an ought. You're going from a norm to a norm, but you're going from an undeniable norm, one that everyone by virtue of participating argument already presupposes, basically just say peace or willingness to negotiate, that kind of stuff. Um, and also property norms, right? Because we have to recognize that I'm uh, peace simply is another way of saying I'm not going to hit you. But saying I'm not going to hit you basically means that you own your body, right? That's another way of saying that. So property rights of your body are the core thing that's recognized in any discussion between people. Um, and then and then you can understand that also arguing and living is a practical affair. So these people couldn't even be existing and participating in discourse if they couldn't survive in the world, which means the ability to act, which means in in, in Austrian terms, the ability to use scarce resources and scarce means. So that means that so that means that the the property rights in your body are a prototype for the idea of property rights in other means that we employ in the world to to live and survive and be part of the discourse. So Hans presented this in I think it was 1988 in Liberty Magazine in a big symposium, and it blew my mind because I was study I was a I was a I was a, a growing um, I had been a libertarian for a long time but. Mostly a minarchist, a Randian type minarchist, but I recently become influenced by some of the anarchists like Rothbard and, and the Tannehills and, and David Friedman and people like that. So I was hungry for this stuff, but I also had a dissatisfaction with natural law thinking. And um, I was also in contract theory, contract law, say, sorry, in contract class at the same time in law school as my first year. And I come across this, this principle of estoppel, which is, which is a legal principle. In contract cases and in other situations, which basically says that a person um, who represents a fact about the world to someone else to induce them to do something, and that other person relies upon that representation to their detriment, um, you can't later deny what you had said in a, in a like a lawsuit about it. So you're stopped or prevented because it's, so it's basically it's a type of way of. Uh, it's a way of making you be consistent. So the, the question isn't whether your first statement is true. It's, it's just simply that you can't change, you can't, you can't contradict yourself. So there was something about that that appealed to me. And when I read Hoppe's argumentation, I think it's sort of all gelled together. And it made me think that you can you could take the estoppel idea and extend that, take that core idea and use that to develop libertarian rights theory too, which is what I did in my own writing. So my own writing is like a, a theory of rights based upon the estoppel. Or an extension of legal estoppel reasoning, but it's very it's very um, complementary to and draws upon a lot of Hoppe's argumentation ethics. So that's sort of a base a, a basic um, overview. Now, in that in that article, there was a symposium, and there's about a dozen or eighteen uh, liber well known libertarians at the time who were invited to respond. David Friedman, uh, I think Douglas Rasmussen, uh, David Gordon, Murray Rothbard. T. Bar McCann um, um, and others, and Roderick most Long, of, I think also responded. Roderick, to, Roderick Long, yeah. and most of them uh, either lightly or, or or severely criticized Hoppe's argumentation ethics, except for Rothbard. Rothbard thought it was breathtakingly um, uh, a pathbreaking argument, and basically was a, was an insight that that kind of broke a logjam in thinking. So. Rothbard recognized that his own natural law argumentation was sort of flawed, but that Hoppe had found the key to fix it. Like, uh, um, you're not really you're not really bridging the Izzard gap; you're sidestepping it with this technique. Uh, the others were mixed in their criticisms. Uh, I think they're basically all flawed or uncharitable, or they're misunderstand they misunderstand Hoppe's argument. Um, he did reply to some of them in a subsequent. Um, um, Issue of Liberty magazine, and those are collected as the appendix to his second book, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. And it's it's had some success over the years in influencing people. It's still not accepted by a large number of libertarians. I think partly for professional jealousy and partly because of lack of understanding, and partly because some people are just stuck in their old arguments and they don't want to give it up. You know, they're they're just used to the Randian way of doing it or the Aristotelian way or the utilitarian approach. Or whatever, but I think it's I think it's the correct approach, and um, is is the is the way forward to, to build upon that. Now, you you mentioned Jurgen Habermas's and Carl Otto Apple's uh, 
discourse ethics. And studying that, I noticed that they make a couple arbitrary assumptions. For example, Habermas states that the something called the universalization principle is key to Habermas's argument. However, he reformulates it in order to claim that that everyone who will be who everyone who will be affected by the norm in question is entitled to participate in argumentation yeah. in a way. So so that seems to me an arbitrary assumption, whereas Professor Hoppe is saying, no, by the very fact of proposing something in argumentation, you are presupposing certain norms, certain certain conventions, so to speak. I, that, that might not be an appropriate word to use in this context, but so that that was one one error that I that I found. And well, I think that um, Hoppe actually does not go into a lot of detail about the details of of, of Habermas and Appel. He just took that core insight. Um, if you try to read through their stuff, it's extremely murky, and I, I don't find it. It's not even very coherent. A lot of it, especially uh, Habermas, he has all this stuff about worlds, world one and world two, and they 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 have a lot of um, reliance. Is that similar to modal modal logic? Because in, in philosophy, we have something called modal logic, where you work within different universes. I don't know. The, I think it was his own terminology. I'm not sure. I'm not a philosopher. Okay. I'm not sure, but but he they both took for granted. I think uh, democracy, like as a they took that as a um, uh, as they assumed that was a valid system, like democracy itself. Right. So they they incorporate this ideal of democracy and democratic decision making into their discourse ethics, which I think makes it just flawed right there because it's a it's a it's a question begging type thing. Then, and of course you're going to get democratic socialist norms out of that once you assume that. Um, and they go into all kinds of metaphysical excursions, which especially for Habermas, which to me are almost incomprehensible and, and noise. Um, now, I haven't read them in German. Obviously, I don't speak German, uh, and the translations are hard to find. Um, Appel seems more common sense to me, but basically when I read them, I get the core insight, which Hoppe took and ran with and, and used uh, praxeology and, and radical libertarian thinking to – and you know, understanding of scarcity and property. I don't think these guys dwell upon scarcity and that kind of stuff that much. But um, as for universalizability, uh, I think that's more of a Kantian insight that that Hopper right, brings the, in. The the Kantian categorical imperative. I believe. And the more I've thought about this over the years, I think universalizability is a presupposition of discourse because the entire endeavor of of discourse about norms simply means to give reasons for your propositions and your claims. So if I propose, okay, the rule is X, like like the rule is uh, white people have rights and black people don't, let's say, like the, let's say right. that's the rule. I've got to give a reason for that, right? If I, if, I, if I simply say, well, white people have rights because I'm white and you don't have rights because you're black, so I have rights because I'm me and you don't have rights because you're you, that's what Hoppe would – criticize and Kant would criticize as a particularizable rule. Like, and, and to, to my mind, that simply means that you're failing to give a reason, right? Which is what universalized – when you say you have to come up with a rule that's universalizable, that means you have to be able to universalize it to everyone. It has to apply in a sense equally to everyone. And the reason is if you have discourse with another person, the presupposition is that we're both rational actors. So we have some characteristic in common that makes it an argument. Like in, you're not going to have an argument with – with a statue or the tree or with a bull. But when right. you have a rational argument with another person who's a participant in discourse, you're assuming that we have enough sufficiently similar characteristics to be part of the same discourse and that those those characteristics make it. So if I say I have a certain right, then the prima facie assumption is I have that right because of my nature. But the only nature that we agree on that we have is whatever we share in common at first. So if I'm claiming a right, I have to at least at first admit that you have that right too because we have the same nature. So whatever reason, whatever source or whatever whatever characteristic of my nature gives me this right, I have to recognize at least prima facie you have it too. If I want to say we don't have the same rights, I have to come up with an argument. I have to give a reason, which is what universalizability to my mind means. So for example, people have criticized Hoppe's argumentation ethics by saying that, well, he says that it is impossible to argue without recognizing other people's bodily rights, but what about a master arguing with his slave? Um, as Hoppe explains, well, all that means is some people are not being consistent, right? You, 
and it's recognizing that rights are prescriptive. They're norms. They can't. They're not like laws of nature. They're not causal laws that can't be violated. Like you, you cannot violate the law of gravity, but you can violate a, a, a normative law, a prescriptive law, because they just tell you what you should do. Like you can violate someone's rights. So just because you treat someone in a way that's unjustified doesn't mean that you've proven that it's just, right? Um, but I, what I would say is, uh, let's suppose I have. A criminal is attacking my family. Uh, he's trying to burn my farm down, right, and murder all my – murder my family, and I capture the guy, and I hog tie him, and I tie him down waiting for the sheriff to arrive for a few hours. Okay, so for that three-hour period while I'm waiting, I got this guy subdued. He's – he's I basically kidnapped him. I basically enslaved him, right? I put him in a right. cage or whatever, so he's my slave. Now, I could have a conversation with the guy. We could talk about this if we want to, right? And so some people will say, well, I'm proving that argumentation ethics is invalid because I am holding a slave, and I'm arguing with him at the same time. But the, what I would say is this. I am saying I have the right to use force against your body, and you don't have the right to use force against mine. I am coming up with a different rule for us, but I can ground it in something. I can point to some objective fact of reality that does give me a, a, a just – claim to have a different rule for each of us, and that is that you committed aggression against me. right? But in general, the prima facie assumption when people argue is you have to assume they're the same. So unless you can point to an objective distinction – so what, what people have done in terms of bigotry and this kind of stuff is you'll say, well, I'm a man. You're a woman, and men and women are different. Well, men and women are different, but do, are they relevantly different? right? You could say whites and blacks are different. They have different skin color and maybe some different, I don't know, some different genetic characteristics. Okay, right. they are different, but we know that they're similar enough to have an argument. So they're both rational human actors. Is the difference there relevant? You know, what if I'm six foot one and you're six foot two? Is that, that's a difference, but is it a relevant difference? You can't just come up with a difference. You have to point to a relevant difference that justifies. Uh, having a different norm or rule applied to each person. So I think in the case of someone who has committed aggression, they have used force against me. So by my estoppel theory, they have laid down the law, something like this. I agree that it's okay to use force against other people when they object. And I'm like, okay, I'm accepting your rule. I'm going to use force against you when you're objecting to being imprisoned because you've, you've already said you agree with that rule. You know, um, right. So the point is you, you come up with a reason. So to me, the universalizability requirement simply means to give a reason, but the reason can't be arbitrary because then it's not right. a reason. Right. So it has to be grounded in the nature of things, which is what Hoppe and Kant uh, emphasize. So when I read your your estoppel, a new just, justification for individual rights, I was I was fascinated by your formulation of the argument because you point out, as you previously mentioned, that when a murderer commits a crime, he is presupposing that he has that right. Now, in the court of law, he could say, "No, I don't think that anymore." However, he would then be trapping himself because he would he would be conceding that what he the act that he committed was wrong. So he would be conceding that presupposing in making that statement. That the that he, that they can prosecute him, that the state or whatever legal institution to which he is subject can prosecute him. So I thought that was an interesting, an Correct. interesting formulation. Correct, because he's still objecting to being punished. So when you object right. to being punished, you're, now you're taking a stance that it's wrong to use force. So, right. but he, if he concedes that he used force before, he's conceding that he did something that was wrong. So presumably, mm -hmm. if if I were to use force against him, he doesn't want to just say it's wrong. He wants there to be some sanction applied to me if I do it, which means right. he's conceding right. that some sanction should be applied to him because he did it. So the, the thing is the reason, the reason you can't change your mind there is because he can't undo the fact that he already acted. He's mm -hmm. already done some damage. He's already invaded someone's property. He's already oh. used it without their consent. That can't oh. be undone. So oh. it's too late for him to deny it. Right. Yeah. And I think, as you as you mentioned, I mean, he would be he would essentially be conceding in the court of law if he says, "I don't think this anymore. This isn't a performative contradiction, given that I'm I'm saying two contradictory things. This isn't a performative contradiction, since I don't think this anymore. Since I think I, I now think my past actions were wrong, were immoral. Well, then he would be conceding in the court of law that they that they can prosecute him, which I again found thought was a. Uh, was an interesting formulation of the argument. Uh, before we conclude, I want to ask you about a couple 
criticisms that you mentioned. Roderick Long, for example, uh, points out that I, I, I think this is a fundamental misconception, misunderstanding on his part. But Roderick Long made the argument that according to what we call Aristotelian negative demonstration, you can point out that Huppa's that, that that you have to prove that Huppa's premises are true. And if you if you want to prove that Huppa's premises are true, then you end up making another argument and you end up with this infinite regress. Regressus ad infinitum. So he says that according to Aristotelian negative demonstration, this essentially falsifies Huppa's argument. Which I, I think Huppa has, has addressed this 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 counterpoint in his lecture, which I believe he delivered at the Property and Freedom Society, in which he said that, no, that's that's not true because this is a transcendental argument. In order to propose anything, Correct. you have to presuppose certain things. You're not trying to derive the conclusion from certain premises. Correct. So I, I, uh, uh, yeah, so Hans replied to some of the criticisms in the original Liberty thing, and then he sort of left it alone for a long time, except for one, crit one reply to Lauren Lemaski too, I believe. Um, but then uh, I think it was 2015 at the PFS, he, he finally dressed up his argumentation ethics again, and he, uh, and he replied to a lot of them again. So that's a good one to listen to. Now, Roderick – so here, here's what I recall. I can't remember everything in Roderick's original reply, but Roderick has written something interesting, um, which was – has also been relied upon by uh, an, an, another uh, colleague of mine named Jeffrey Allen Ploche, who's an Aristotelian anarchist libertarian. Uh, Roderick has this idea that he thinks you can get – if I'm, if I'm stating Roderick correctly, he might correct me here. You can get over this Humean objection from going from uh, that you can't go from an is to an ought by by not using um, so so I, here's the idea Kant has categorical imperatives and he distinguishes those from hypothetical imperatives hypothetical would be if then right so like right if if you want to have human well being and prosperity and peace then you should have libertarian norms right so. That's just applying common sense libertarian or, or free market economics and political knowledge and his, historical knowledge to the to the presupposed goal of uh, we want peace and prosperity. But that's an if then. That still doesn't get you over the is ought problem because it's a saying if. And what if someone doesn't have that same value? Roderick says, well, there's something called so, and and the categorical hypo hypothetical is is Kantian. That's not that's not Aristotelian. So we can't use categorical, and an if then doesn't really solve the is ought divide. Roderick says there's something called an assertoric hypothetical, and instead of being an if then, it's a since then. So it's like since you agree on this norm that we all share and we all agree on, then you should do X, and. I actually think that is very similar to Hoppe's argumentation ethics. He's saying since we all favor peace, parentheses, when we're arguing, then the following norms have to be accepted as valid, or they're the only ones that can be justified. So they're both in a way a since then or an assertoric hypothetical. I don't think the Aristotelians would agree with me on this because they were jealous about their territory, but just like Ayn Rand would not agree that she was a Kantian, <laughs> but right, right. Ayn Rand's arguments for her – her axiom, her axioms like uh, existence exists, consciousness exists. Um, there is a conscious observer, and there's a universe out there that we observe that we're aware of that's different from us. Um, the law of non-contradiction. These various axiomatic truths, things that are undeniably true, you validate those truths the same way that some a priori truths uh, in Mises and uh, the neo-Kantian Mises. Would, would justify, and then the way Hoppe would justify some of his. So it's the same kind of – I've always thought it's the same kind of logical demonstration. Uh, now, I think, again, like I say, some of the, the neo-Aristotelians like Long and, and Ploche might not agree to this, but I think the sense then, the assertoric hypothetical, is basically the same solution that, um, that Hoppe has come up with. All right, so I think that's a good conclusion for uh, argumentation ethics. Now we can move on to… Uh, I guess the Austrian reconstruction of history and how much Hoppe contributed to that, which I guess to put it simply is applying Austrian economics and principles like time preference to history to give us better views on what happened and why things happened. And of course, Hoppe also applies things like argumentation ethics and uh, class analysis 
to his views on history. So I'd love to hear uh, Mr. Kinsella's views on that. Well, so uh, if I understand what you're talking about, um, in the theory of socialism and capitalism, the first several chapters – so the first two chapters are his property analysis, um, and then he goes into his essentialist understanding of what socialism and capitalism are. So most people say socialism is the centralized ownership of the means of production, um, and capitalism is the private ownership of the means of production. And Han says, well, yeah, that's true, but the essence of these things is really – um, socialism is the institutionalized interference with or aggression against private property, and capitalism is the is the institutionalized respect or recognition of private property rights. So, like just generalizing them, um, uh, and so then he takes that understanding of socialism, capitalism, and he analyzes different forms historically of socialism. So I think he's got a chapter, socialism Russian style, socialism. Um, um, I think fascist style or something like that. So socialism, social democratic style. So he, he so in the theory of socialism and capitalism, he analyzes and dissects various forms of socialism, which all share essentially socialism in common, like they all aggress against private property rights, but in different ways, right? So you have centralized planning of communism, you have the nominal private ownership of, of fascism, uh, but still state control. And then you have social democracies, which this diffuse uh, democratic system still controls private property and invades private property rights, and he analyzes that. So that's one thing he's done. And then he also has an interesting article on um, arguing about reunification of East and West Germany, uh, where where he was from. So um, that's another interesting uh, insight. Um, as far as reformulating history, probably the one of the the single best things to read on this would be his introduction to his democracy book, where he basically has a complete reformulation. Uh, of the understanding of modern history, starting say with World War, uh, like 1900s or around the beginning of 19, uh, the, tw the 20th century, where he he says, look, the traditional idea is that, um, and even Rothbard and Mises and some libertarians share this in their reverence for the American founding, and the Constitution and uh, the modern world, this reverence for democracy, like they know it's not perfect, but. They thought it was an improvement from the old system, like the ancient regime of monarchies and and things like that. Uh, it's certainly superior to uh, to dictatorships and authoritarian states and um, um, you know theocracies and empires. But uh, but is it is it really an improvement over republics and and republican monarchies? Um, See, he argues that that it wasn't; it was retrogression, or at least in some way. So, so when with the, with the uh, with after World War One, you know, he says like uh, you know, American intervention caused it to be uh, this major ideological war, which had to which had to um, result in the total extinction of the previous systems, uh, the total subjugation of Germany. You know, uh, through the, first, the Treaty of Versailles and all this stuff led to the uprising, which led to World War II and Hitler and Nazism and 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 ultimately all this led to communism and all this stuff. So, you know, I don't know if he blames America because we didn't do it on purpose, but the you know the intervention into World War One led to World War II and communism and the Cold War and and the, the war we have today, and to the erosion of the monarchies and to the rise of democracy and democratic lawmaking and legislation and all that. So that's a fascinating sort of revisionist history, which makes sense to me. I'm not a historian, but it makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about your your position on on Professor Hoppe's an analysis of the origin of human society, because he essentially refutes the Hobbesian position that in the natural state of affairs, everyone would be warring against everyone else. And I, I think two thinkers are worth mentioning here in connection to my to this point. Uh, also discussing because I, I want to delve into the the law of comparative advantage, which was developed by David Ricardo. Uh, there were Mises points out that. The, the law of comparative advantage is predicated upon the fundamental assumption that there are a diversity of resources, a diversity of different talents, different people in the world who can then cooperate in order to increase total output and individual consumption for each exchange participant. And this is obviously impossible if everyone is 
perfectly equal to everyone else. In, in, a, in a perfectly egalitarian world, the division of labor would be essentially useless because there is nothing to exchange. Everyone is, is, is identical. And so I, I, what, I, what I found in, in Professor Hoppe's work is that he also he, – he indirectly – I, I shouldn't say he indirectly, but he addresses a point that was that was made by Jean Jacques Rousseau, which which was that at, at the at the origin when human society the inequality is is emerged when human beings decided to form a society. So they built huts and they began helping each other. And we moved away from from natural resources to property rights, private property, and this is how inequality arose. Whereas someone like Joseph de Maistre, who was a counter revolutionary, argued that inequality is natural and that that we are all inherently unequal to to one another. So H Professor Hoppe's reformulation of or his analysis of the origin of human society, I found very interesting, and I, I was wondering whether you had any any thoughts on on this because it is very, in my in my view, consequential. Well, I do like like one of his uh, good papers that has influenced me. It's it's in the journal that I found in Libertarian Papers. He wrote an article in there, and it sort of reformulates a lot of stuff he had written in his earlier books. But uh, it's about sort of the logical kind of origins, plus the historical origins of humanity. And um, I don't really know a lot about um, his particular. I can't recall right now his particular views on. Uh, the sort of primitive primitive man's uh, normative systems or something like that um but uh uh he he uh in, in that article he he imagines like a town right a primitive town which has to have some respect for property rights um and he even in that in that article he even admits that you can have so-called collective ownership of property, like the town can have an easement over the road. And he's using that, I think, in service of his immigration stuff. Now, there was a, a big debate which Hoppe contributed to in the in the late 80s, if I recall, um, in the Review of Austrian Economics. I have a lot of links assembled on my website under a mm -hmm. post called the Great Dehomogenization Debate. And I think Joe Salerno started that. And Joe Salerno makes a lot of the same comments that um, he's he's opposing the Hayekian view of knowledge being dispersed and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's like Hayek views it as a problem to be solved through the free market. And he, Salerno points out, similar to what you just said about Hoppe, that uh, you know the differences in knowledge is a good thing. It leads to the division and specialization of labor, which of course is a point of Mises too. That when people have empathy with each other, they cooperate and they trade, but they develop the specialization and division of labor. Um, one thing I have liked about Hoppe, and this relates a little bit to this, is his his way of – like I've always been dissatisfied with the left-right spectrum, right? As a libertarian, like at first I took the, the standard Nolan chart view of things, right? Like, oh, we're, orthog we're orthogonal to the left-right spectrum, um, and left-right is virtually meaningless because left and right at the extremes are both socialist, and they're both horrible and totalitarian. Um, but the way Hoppe reformulated it in a talk several years ago is that he says that – Essentially, the left, the, the main characteristic of left, left thinking is egalitarianism, which is unrealistic. Um, and the essential characteristic of the right is re being realistic, realistic about the existence of differences between people and natural authority figures and natural hierarchies among people. Um, and in, in that formulation of the left right divide, which I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I would agree, and I would I would be a rightist, right? I would be a realist, and I don't oppose hierarchies right. and natural natural authority. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's almost inconceivable to imagine a world of e of equality because it's sort of like if you have you know people say, uh, what if you clone someone or you you duplicate someone with a Star Trek transporter or you have two twins? Why aren't they the same? It's like well, even if you could copy yourself and the, the other guy walks out of the out of the teleporter machine with your same memories from that second on you're going to diverge and be different people right because your experiences are different so even in a world of if everyone looked the same was the same height the same age everything they still wouldn't be the same so you would have to have natural specialization emerge i think it's impossible to imagine a, a world of automatons who are exactly the same because no one no one's located in the same location on the earth. You know, they're all right. Right. It's just uh, 
so just like entropy happens in different ways, you know, little clusters of, of, of order here and there, and it's random in some way, everyone's going to be different. And that's going to lead over time to the specialization and division of labor, which is a good thing, right? Because it makes us more efficient. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's one thing I've gotten from some of this, this writing. Yeah, well, he, he also addresses Rothbard's Rothbard's argument, which which you can find in the towards in the, in the first I, I believe one of the first sections of Man, Economy, and State, in which he says, we we can human society did not form because of a mystical sense of communion between between men amongst men. Human society formed because of the economic advantages of the division of labor, which Ludwig von Mises points out, and that's what I wanted to yeah to uh, to address and and ask you about because someone like Hobbes. Would would disagree with that, and and Rousseau, I think, was also very harmful uh, to the to the development of the social sciences because he contrived this idea of of, of inequality being a construct rather than an inherent property of mankind. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I'm more of a Randian in the sense I don't think there's a natural conflict of interest between people. In fact, I don't think rights can conflict at all. Um, right. So you never have to balance rights. Um, they're always compossible. Hillel Steiner would say. Um, I, I assume, and I think uh, Hans Hoppe would agree with Mises. Mises has a lot of interesting stuff. I, I've got a couple of blog posts like empathy as a source of rights. Mises talks about how um, the division of labor society makes us empathetic, or maybe it's the other way around. I think they all naturally go together. What, what I what I personally think happens is that we evolved in a certain way as a social species, um, partly because intelligence. <laughs> Intelligence gave us an advantage, right? So bigger, bigger heads and brains gave us an advantage, but that required the mother to give birth before the baby was 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 formed, basically, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise it would kill her. Um, right. So unlike other uh, some other mammal species where the you know the foal comes out ready to walk and is independent, uh, so or some um, fish or, 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 or things like that, uh, the baby comes out unformed. And needs is dependent and hopeless for for a long time, and so that I mean, maternal feelings developed and the social structure around that. So, I think all that contributed towards the development of empathy, which simply means that psychologically most normal people um, have a certain natural value of other people's well being. Maybe not as strong as their own, but they they do value other people's well being. So they don't don't you know so they have a desire to help other people and to want to be part of the community. And to so they have a propensity to to have social intercourse, to trade, and to cooperate with each other. Um, now, the the fact of scarcity leads to war and conflict and fighting. But the reason we've had progress in human civilization and history is because there is an advantage to to trading. The the people that do tend to trade and to live socially in civilization with each other are more more economically. Effective, so they're richer, so they are more powerful, so they have more weapons, so they dominate, right? Uh, so the misanthropic people tend to die out. So I think there's a natural progression um, that selects for cooperation, right? It's not perfect, right. but I, I think right. that's kind of how we got here. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, on this section, uh, I think these things that have been talked about here and uh, Hoppe's whole views on you know, society and uh, especially primitive society are definitely very useful things to know when speaking with people like Marxists on uh, primitive communism. You know, these things like division of labor and how property rights developed or uh, property in general uh, are definitely very important things to know. Um, so moving on from here, uh, we've got class analysis and Hoppe's sort of reconstruction of the Marxian dialectics. Uh, of course, he applies things like time preference and points out uh, the flaws in Marxist dialectics through uh, ignoring the actual consent of, say, the proletariat with the bourgeoisie. Um, so if Mr. Kinsella could briefly elaborate on Hoppe's whole view of the Marxian dialectics and class analysis. Well, Hoppe has a great article. Um... I'm trying to remember the title now. You might have it up to hand. Uh, uh, what what Marx gets right? Well, I don't know if that's the title. That's maybe the title of the lecture. Uh, yeah, yeah. But he, he has an article that's based upon. It's it's called, I think it's called Marxist and Austrian Class Analysis or right. something like that. Um, 
and I think he makes a kind of a statement startling to some people that like Marxist class analysis is substantially correct, except for one thing. So he goes through the sort of the sort of whole Marxist class analysis of exploitation and different classes uh, exploiting each other or one, one exploiting the other, and he says that's all correct except Marx gets the analysis of exploitation wrong. So Marx thinks exploitation is when the capitalist employer class exploits um, the the working class, and the reason he believed that was he had a, 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 a fallacious view of economics. So he had this labor theory of value, which I think – which came from Ricardo and Smith, Right, and uh, I think you could argue ultimately in a way it might have come from John Locke and his labor theory of property, which are not the same thing, but I think they're related in the end. Um, this the idea that you labor. own your labor. Yeah, so Locke yeah. argued that uh, the reason we own – he was – Locke was trying to argue against the aristocratic divine right of kings idea that kings are basically uh, empowered by God to do whatever they want. He was trying to come up with some limits to that, and I guess this guy named Filmer, if I'm recalling right. I'm not a political scientist, but I think – so Locke was trying to come up with an argument why we have these natural rights that – um, that that even kings can't violate uh, with, without trying to without without sounding too much like he rejected king's authority because he didn't want to get right. killed. You know, so right. I think he, I think his argument is that well, God gave the world to Adam, the first king, um, and he gave into humanity, and he gave the whole world in commons to everyone and all of Adam's children, and effectively the stuff that's not being used yet is unowned. So. Mm -hmm. So, so the argument is that God gives everyone the right to themselves, so they own themselves because God gives you this right to your body or to yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you own your body, but if you say you, if you call it owning yourself, then that's a little bit more metaphorical and vague. And then you say, well, if you own yourself, you own your labor. Right. If you own your labor, then that's why you own these unowned resources that God gave us to use and to enjoy. Right. And you mix your labor with it because now your labor that you own has been mixed with it, and you can't – unless you own the thing you mix it with, you've lost ownership of your labor because it's, it's, it's inextricably bound up in it like when you transform something. Mm -hmm. So that was his argument. He was, he was doing something noble and admirable. He was trying to argue that people have a, a, a solid, natural right, inviolable right to, to these resources that they homestead and that no one can take away from them, you know, even the king. Um, but – to argue that he came up with this kind of fuzzy, you own yourself, therefore you own your labor, therefore you own things you mix it with. So, which I think is wrong. It's just you don't own your labor, and you don't need to say you own your labor to argue that you own things you mix your labor with. What you can right. say is that right. you've you've established an objective link between yourself and this thing, which gives you a better claim on it than anyone else because you've transformed it in an objective way, you set up a mm -hmm. border around it or whatever. But it's Hoppe's argument, by the way. Um, so you don't need to go through this this step. And by the way, David Hume saw through this. David Hume said Locke is right, but he didn't need to add this labor. It was an unnecessary. I think he called it a circumlocution, or like it was an unnecessary step. And right. I think that, that right. so this idea that you own labor has been around for a long time, and it's sort of a mis I won't call it mystical, but it's just it's not coherent and rigorous. And I think that's that's present in this labor theory of value, like trying to explain why something has. A value on the market it's because well you you put your labor into it it's this all this idea that we're these people that exude this substance called labor right it's just not true you don't exude labor it's not a thing that you own um but and I, I believe that's also the the argument they make for intellectual property rights yeah yeah it's, because, i think it's yeah, right it's, it's led to intellectual property as well right so i this this mistake that Locke made has corrupted political theory and economy and, and, and all this. Anyway, so so Marx basically believes that the employer, if he makes a profit, then he's selling the product that the that the worker made with his labor for more than the value of the labor that well, he's selling it. The worker's not getting the full return on the labor he put into it because mm -hmm. there's a difference between what he's paying in wages to the laborer and what he's selling it for. That's how he makes a profit. So the very existence of profit by the capitalist or the employer is 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 exactly the amount of surplus labor value you're stealing from the worker. Right. So it's theft. 
um, which they call exploitation. So that's what his class analysis is based upon. And Hoppe said, well, that's just that's just wrong. I mean, because you know, if you have a proper understanding of economics, the Austrian view, you understand that there's no theft at all. However, the exploitation is the act of aggression against people's private property claims, and that is where the state comes in. So the state and its and its cronies that is the, is the small class that exploits the people that you know the, the it's the taxing versus the taxed to to put it crudely so he reformulates uh, austrian or marx's class theory by saying it's all correct as long as you replace labor labor theft with aggression right well i, I he actually i believe he said that if you if you replace the word bourgeois with the state in every single one of Marx's writings, that would render that would render them correct. And Sounds I think right. it's a, yeah. right. I, I think it's important to to point out that Marx is the, the the entire Marxian schema is is derived from his adaptation of of Hegelian dialectic. So Marx believed that there was a base and a superstructure, and that the base consisted of uh, cons, cons, consists of productive forces, the modes of production, and productive relations. And Rothbard wrote a really brilliant article on this in which he points out that, no, it's actually – it's not the base that influences the superstructure. It's the superstructure that influences the base. It's mm. ideas and legal institutions and the framework in which property rights are, are acted upon in which people exchange with one another that determines uh, whatever productive forces means. I think Rothbard analogizes that with – compares that with uh, – with technology and technological methods. So M Rothbard in, is essentially inverted that that base superstructure relation and adapted it, although it's not, I don't want to delve into the esoteric details of this, but uh, Marx's Marxian dialect is, is bidirectional, whereas, whereas Rothbard's formulation is unidirectional, meaning you can't have material, material forces cannot influence ideas, so to speak. It's the conscious actors who employ purposeful action that then mm. influence the base. Mm. So, I mean, Marx had this idea that when there's a change in technology, for some reason, those productive relations are not going to change. So in order for that process to occur naturally, there would have to be a social revolution. And of course, Marx, Marx was a polylogist. Mises uses this term in, in human action. He believed that each class has its own logic, that they don't follow the laws of reason, which in my view is is, compl is Preposterous. Yeah, I but, think <laughs> um, in in the festrift we did for Hoppe for his 60th birthday called Property Freedom, right? And it's just, what's it called? Property Property Freedom and Society. Yeah, named after his Property and Freedom Society. Uh, <laughs> I think Jeff Tucker, my friend Jeff Tucker, has an essay in there on polylogism. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's very interesting how. I we I was actually discussing something I call Huppian dialectics with a with a couple friends of mine, a couple uh, several days ago, and I pointed out that the entire Austrian view essentially re rejects dialectical materialism, and then we can adapt that and 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 apply it to Austrian class analysis by I mean Rothbard in the ana in the Anatomy of the State uses Albert J. Knox's distinction between the economic and productive means to wealth. You can either expropriate wealth mm -hmm. or voluntarily uh, formulate uh, establish contracts and, and, and trade within the framework yeah. of property rights, the normative framework of property rights. Yeah, and I think also that's um, either De Juvenal or one of these other guys, yeah, the, the, product, uh, the, uh, the, economic, yeah, the economic means versus the mm -hmm. uh, political means. Right. Yes, I, I believe it was Knox and De Juvenal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you about your 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 opinion on what I what I believe to be the necessity uh, of developing what I call libertarian social philosophy in order to counter some of the new left wing developments, such as the synthesis of Freudian psychoanalysis and Marxian class theory by the by the Frankfurt School, because now they're working with with a completely different definitional framework. It's not that. It, they don't define coercion as physical violence. They define, for example, the the patriarchal household is inherently coercive because the man has functional authority, or the wife, the husband has functional authority over the wife. So I, I wanted to ask you about what your your thoughts on on developing a libertarian social philosophy in order to counter some of the more recent developments that have occurred on the radical left, what I would call the cultural Marxist left, what Paul Gottfried calls the cultural Marxist left. 
I mean, on those matters, I'm more of a student than I haven't written a lot about that or developed a lot of that. Um, I have basically, um, I mean, I know Hoppe has written a lot on this, and I there's very little I've read about, uh, by Hoppe uh, and other and, and Rothbard and others on on these topics that I disagree mm -hmm. with. Um, but I just haven't really specialized in that stuff myself. Um, a lot of times these discussions come up when we talk about uh, strategy and tactics. Like when – instead of talking about libertarian theory itself and like what – like from our philosophical armchairs, which, which laws are justified and, and what systems are justified, um, what our rights are, right. when you talk about – being an activist and trying to achieve liberty, right? Which is which is a substantial part of people that call themselves libertarians. And in fact, a lot of those guys seem to be unaware of the fact that libertarianism is not necessarily activism. Like that's all their lives are in it. Like they came in through the Ron Paul movement. So they view everything through the lens of activism. Like so if you promote if you're you now some of the unprincipled or the non-radical guys, like if 30 years ago, if you would say, we need we need to we need to legalize cocaine. They would say, well, that's not going to sell. Mm -hmm. And right. that's true. That won't sell to the public, but they're they're viewing the validity of the statement by the lens of whether it will succeed, right? Right. So when you have this activist mentality, everything you're searching for is how can we achieve liberty? Uh, what tactics can we use? What strategy can we use? And when you do that, then you do need to get more into social theory, like um, uh, because it's all part of a whole approach to life sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there are a lot of, and the left has been good at this, right? That's why they've been, I think, dominant the last many decades. Uh, they, they they have found a way to win the cultural wars, um, which is, I mean, I personally think that we have to have a cultural fight ourselves to counter that and some people are trying to do that you know it used to be the chronicles magazine crowd it's kind of the paleo libertarians now to some degree i don't know right. if they have a coherent overall worldview some people are grasping at different strands of it like when you have these neo neo monarchists now and you have the kind of um, alt-right stuff mm -hmm. uh, but it's just not my wheelhouse really to be honest i mean i'm happy to talk about any particular issue but i'm generally yeah. in favor of 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 the traditional, uh, you know, what Hoppe views as the, uh, like for example, in Hoppe's writing, he talks about covenant communities, and he he and everyone thinks he's advocating for this. I don't know if he exactly is. He's more predicting, like in a in a free in a private law society, you can't just be libertarians. You're going to have people with values and practices and customs and things in their life that are not libertarian. That's just mm -hmm. you know, their religion. Their their tribe, their their history, uh, their family units, their their country, their countrymen, and people would tend to segregate in a sense or live among people that had similar values and customs and traditions, and that would affect the the way you live and the places that you live. Right. Um, I, I tend to think it wouldn't be quite as legalistic as a lot of people interpret that. They think that you know you walk into Club A. You know, uh, city A, and you you pass the the gates, and you have to sign a big contract agreeing to mm -hmm. all this stuff. I think it would be more organic, and it would be less rigid. But I think that would tend to happen. Of course, you know, you're going to have a Mormon area, you're going to have a Muslim area, you're going to have a, a secular area, um, you're going to have. But I think by and large, it would be dominated by the sort of traditional family based, culturally conservative in the sense of. Not having a big opposition to the heterosexual family unit as the basis of society, right? Even if you have priests around or single guys or gay people, that's fine. They can live among these people, but they're not in an outright hostile opposition to it. You know, a priest lives around uh, councils and lives and in, in supported by married people, but he's not criticizing the institution of marriage, even though he's he's not married. You know, so. I guess right, that's well, the extent of my my deep knowledge on this topic. Yeah, th that is precisely what I meant because because of the Fra because of the Frankfurt School, we now have this prevailing notion that the white heterosexual family is the source of all evils in Western civilization. And in order to counter this, I think we really need to develop something like a libertarian social philosophy. And hearkening back to your point about 
help his analysis of monarchy, he actually points out that he, he uses Elodio, what we call Elodio feudalism, as an example of this. Because before the, the development of what, what I might call uh, monarchical absolutism, you had a very decentralized order in the early Middle Ages. I, I believe families would form hundred, hundreds, these hundreds would form counties, counties would form duchies, and these duchies would, duchies would form kingdoms. Mm -hmm. But communities would voluntarily commend themselves to the protection of lords, for example. And lords yeah. would depend on the, on the loyalty of the, or their vassals precisely because there was no force. I mean, the, the common understanding of law was that you can't initiate violence. The king is subject to the same law as, as the peasant or the, or the tenant. And what overturned this, in a way, was the Protestant Reformation, mm. which challenged the, the authority of, of, the, of the church. And there was a, there's, a, there's a Belgian historian, I think he passed away, named, uh, I, I can't remember, Henri Piren, that's it. Uh, and Henri Piren points out that what, it, what initially happened was that the king... It was decentralized until the, until up to this point, up until this point. The king incited riots by the peasants on the part of the peasants against the lords and then created a Hobbesian situation and told the aristocratic nobles, look, if you do not form an alliance with me, then this will continue on or worsen. So what essentially happened was that the king artificially created a Hobbesian situation by inciting mm. riots amongst the peasants against these lords. And then you had the formation of the monarchical state where the king would now tax and legislate, mm -hmm. whereas that did not exist prior to this development. So, I mean, I, I see very interesting trends in Eric von Kuhn at Ledin, who mm -hmm. called himself a conservative arch liberal, which I, I, I go by that, 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 lab, that name. I also like reactionary libertarian because I'm, I'm still an anarchist, but I believe in, in a very hierarchical yeah. social, social order. I think that would result naturally from – from libertarianism. Well, as Hoppe has pointed out, um, uh, you know, even though from a pure libertarian point of view, you can't justify, you know, a monarch either. Right. However, right. however, the monarchs um, were way more limited in their powers, and they were identifiable. So, you know, if you have a horrible monarch, he could be killed <laughs> or driven out of power. Yeah. Um, and you could, on occasion, have a good monarch. I mean, maybe maybe have a tyrant every now and then, but you could also have a good one, like just by luck. But in democracy, you're never going to have uh, you're never going to have good democratic rulers because it, the system selects for corrupt, venal, short-sighted, high time preference people. That's just mm -hmm. the nature of the system. The, the high, even Hayek saw this, like the, the you know the worst rise to the top because of the nature of democracy. But at least on occasion, I mean, Hans tells a funny story about uh, one of his friends um, who was robbed. I don't know if you ever heard this story, but he was – Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he was robbed yeah. at an ATM one night like in Germany or somewhere, and so some guy held him up and saw him getting money out of the ATM and held him up and robbed him of his money. And the, and the, and the guy looked at the robber and said <laughs> – he goes, I need some money to take a cab to get home. So the robber handed him 20 – you know, twenty dollars or whatever the equivalent was, twenty dollars back. <laughs> so you you could you could even have a nice robber on occasion, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but you never have a nice democracy because the the logic of the system makes it always get worse and worse and more metastasized. Right, and the, and the difference is that that everyone can enter the state apparatus. So so politicians' time preferences are significantly higher than those of monarchs. Monarchs would think about the capital value of the of the country, so to speak. And they would well, not. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. They would. They would. They would take into consideration the capital value of the country. Yeah. Whereas, whereas democratic politicians, they have this mindset that look, we're going to loot and expropriate as much wealth as possible because we have term limits, and uh, and we can we can establish many friendships, long lasting relationships with with prominent people, whoever they may be in the political realm, and. The, the, so their 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 time preferences are are significantly higher than those of monarchs because monarchs would at least try to pass on the country, pass yeah. on the territory to their yeah. And this is all in his, this is all in the, his book Democracy and his writings that preceded that. Um, um, yeah. So th that's the problem with 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 those types of leaders. And and not only that, in democracy. The people are bamboozled. They're fed this idea, which they accept over time, that because they have the right to vote, right? Mm -hmm. So you you lose this clear demarcation or distinction between the rulers and the ruled. Like in a monarchy, 
and even in you know even in North Korea, there everyone knows who the leader, or the state is, and the leaders, right? And they they know that who the people are that are being ruled. Um, whereas in a democracy, it, it gets so big, and you know your cousin or your brother, your husband or your brother, might work for the government in some bureaucracy, and not only that, everyone has the right to vote. And people, mm-hmm. you hear you hear over and over again. Well, you are the state. You you have no right to complain about this law because after all, you had a say so. In the law being formed because you could vote for your representative and blah, blah, blah. So they shut out dissent like that, which allows the government to get away with far more than it could get away with if it was a monarchy. Like a monarch tries to tax more than 5%, 10%, people are going to view it as expropriation and, and revolt. But if you're doing it to yourself, you're going to have 65% taxation, and people are like, well, we did it to ourselves. You can't complain. You have right. a, just vote in the next election if you don't like it. Just vote in the next election. You know, mm. that's what you're told. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that's that's correct. And Hupp also points out if you have inflation, democratic politicians don't care that they're receiving inflated currency because it, it doesn't matter. By the time they re- receive the state apparatus receives inflated currency from the expropriated subject population, that, that democratic politician is out of office. Which is precisely the problem with with democracy as compared to to monarchy. Yeah. So it seems we've already sort of concluded the uh, class analysis, and we're kind of running out of time, anyways. Um, if I were to say just a few more thoughts on the whole class analysis thing, I would say uh, it's actually good to view Hoppe's whole um, correction of Marx as rather a restoration of class analysis, because initially it was people like Charles Comte. Uh, Comte and Charles uh, Denoyer, I believe that's how you pronounce their names, who developed like these class analysis in the early 1800s. And they viewed it in a more similar way that Hopp viewed it between, you know, the ruler and the ruled in the context of the state. And it was actually Karl Marx who kind of ruined it. And then, you know, you have people like Hoppe and mm-hmm. others. I believe Roger Long also wrote on a libertarian class analysis who basically kind of restored it. But also applied uh, marginalist economics to that whole uh, class analysis view. Now, we can kind of wrap it up here. Uh, if anyone has anything more to say, um, Mr. Kinsella or Jung Yin, I think I'm about done. No, I've really enjoyed the conversation. You guys are obviously very well read. Um, what, what are your – are you guys uh, – so uh, political scientist philosophers or what's what are your specialties no i i actually i actually specialize in, in monetary theory but i read a lot of of oh, political philosophy and and history yeah uh, uh, honestly my specialty would be like economic history um or just kind of like dealing with very mainstream things um because like what i do is i make content online content mostly on tiktok uh to change the minds of leftists so i have to deal with you know, a lot of the very mainstream things that people are talking about, you know, they're talking about stagnant wages they're talking about recessions and stuff like that. And so that's what I want to talk to people about. Um, I deal with a lot of like empirical data and stuff like that, because that's what people really respond to. And then from there, when I get people interested, I kind of push them over to, you know, Austrian business cycle theory, uh, argumentation ethics, try to get them to read Hoppe and stuff like that. Um, okay. So Jung Yin is definitely more of a like academic person, and I'm more of a like activist type person. I would Got say. It. Got it. Well, good luck with your podcast. I think it's uh, it's going to be very fruitful and interesting. All right, thank you thank so you. much for being a guest. Uh, thank you everyone for watching, and we will go ahead and wrap this up.